Church, I invite you to turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12, you'll find it in the Pew Bible on page 263. And I'll be reading the, the chapter in its entirety. Verse 1 begins, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the, the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites." Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and she became sick, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, The child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. He then went to his own house. And when, when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servants said to him, what is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went in to her and lay with her. And she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So he called 
his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Now Joab fought against Rabbah of the Ammonites and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rabbah. Moreover, I have taken the city of waters. Now then gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called by my name. So David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. And he, and he took the crown of their king from his head. The weight of it was a talent of gold, and in it was a precious stone, and it was placed on David's head. And he brought out the spoil of the city, a very great amount. And he brought out the people who were in it, and set them in labor with saws and iron picks and iron axes, and made them toil on, at, at the brick kilns. And thus he did to all the cities of the Ammonites. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your honesty and the, the truthfulness of your word is displayed in the, the heroes of our faith and all their flaws, all their warts, all their sin. And Father, we thank you for the display of your grace in these people's lives. It gives us great hope, Father, because we, we, we see our own warts. We know our own sin, and we are comforted uh, by this testimony of your grace, that it is for us as well, for all who believe in Christ. And so bless us now, give us greater understanding of this passage, and uh, we, we trust this in your hands. We pray it in Christ's name, amen. Well, I think we're all familiar with those moments in our modern history where we've watched men who seem to have such great potential or so much going for them, then tragically fall due to some kind of short-term pleasure. There have been those in the political realm, of course, Bill Clinton in the 90s that left at least his legacy permanently tarnished, or here in North Carolina, John Edwards, former senator from North Carolina and vice presidential nominee whose political career was destroyed due to an affair. And there has been, of course, many in the ministry over the years as well that has left us shocked. In all these cases, we respond the normal way with the question, why? Was it really worth it? And of course, in all these examples, there's always a phrase that sums it up. A fall from grace. But is it though? Or at least, does it have to be a fall from grace? The common meaning of that phrase is a loss of favor or a position of power or honor. And it certainly is that. But besides being a fall from grace, could it also be a fall into grace? The fact that they didn't get away with it could be a sign of God's mercy and love working on their behalf. I think that is the direction, the direction that chapter 12 goes in light of David's dramatic fall himself. As we saw last week, David was at the pinnacle of his power defeating a great foreign power in chapter 10 and waiting to soon topple another the following year once the winter was, was over and the fighting season began again. Yet in the midst of all these great victories, David seems to lose sight of God's purposes for him. His priorities go from faithfully serving the Lord to serving his own inclinations. This led to his idleness and not going off to war like he was supposed to as the king. And that then led to him seeing an undressed Bathsheba from his exclusive rooftop view, which of course leads to the affair, which leads to a pregnant Bathsheba and David murdering Bathsheba's husband Uriah to cover everything up. David's cover-up plan seemed to work well except for one small detail in the final verse of chapter 11. The Lord saw it all and was displeased. You know, there's a, there's a verse in Numbers 32, verse 23, 
that is so often repeated we, we forget about its biblical origins. But it says, your sin will find you out. And the point is, of that verse, is that God is always watching His people. And in one sense, that might be true for everyone, but at the same time, we know, for instance, that many crimes do go unsolved, that the perpetrator isn't always caught. Yet, here's the thing and the point of our passage today. If God cares about the perpetrator, if God cares about the perpetrator, then you can count on the fact that their sins will be found out if he cares for them. If you're, if you're hiding sin and you seem to be getting away with it, that is a very scary place. God might be allowing you to get away with it so that you then die in your sin and under his eternal judgment. But for David, the Lord cared too much. He loved David too much to let him get away with his sin. So David didn't fall from grace. He fell into it. As harsh as chapter 12 may seem, it is actually an account of how a righteous and holy God loves his wayward children and brings them back. It's a story about grace in response to sin in the Christian life. And I see four main lessons for us about this grace. The Lord in grace pursues, convicts, corrects, and reconciles. Those are our four points today of how God's grace pursues, convicts, corrects, and reconciles. So we begin with how the Lord in his grace pursues us when we sin. We see this very clearly in verse 1 of chapter 12. It says, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. The Lord sent a prophet to David to confront him about his sin. Interesting note here, though, is when the Lord sent Nathan. We know from the end of chapter 11 that the child that David conceived with Bathsheba had already been born. So the Lord gave close to nine months at least before sending Nathan. There could be different reasons for that. One is perhaps to allow time for David's heart to be prepared for the confrontation. Often, immediately after someone commits a sin, they are in very much a defensive mode. Just like we saw with David going to the extreme measure of killing Uriah to cover up his sin. A person in sin can be on high alert to defend themselves and justify their sin. It has long been held that Psalm 32 was written by David in response to this incident here with Nathan along with Psalm 51. But in Psalm 32, David describes how he felt during the time between his sin and Nathan's confrontation, saying this, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, when I kept silent, that's the period where he was trying to keep his sin a secret. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. David, in other words, was feeling the weight of his sin. The loss of true fellowship with God. The guilt was heavy on his heart. And when that happens, folks, that is a good sign that a person is a believer when they struggle to live with their sin, that it bothers them. When someone, when someone is, is professing to be a believer and is, is okay to, to live with it and doesn't bother them in any way, that's, that's a serious concern there. Okay? But, it, it's, but it's, it's evidence here 
of God working providentially in a believer's life, like here with David, through the circumstances of life, preparing their heart to be confronted, to come to repentance. So David was being pursued by God, in a sense, even before God sends Nathan. And he does the same thing in the lives of of believers today. But of course, we don't have prophets like Nathan today that can say with confidence, thus says the Lord. So when it comes time to to be direct, how does the Lord speak to believers today? Well, the prophets of the Bible have, of course, been replaced with the written account of their messages, which is, of course, the Bible. And if we are really truly seeking to follow the Lord, we will actually be able to, uh, in some ways, self-medicate in dealing with a lot of our sin. Because in a healthy Christian life, we will go to God's Word regularly anyway. And as I mentioned last week, oftentimes the Lord will speak to us directly about our sin as we read the Scriptures and ask the question, how does this Scripture, how does this passage apply to my life? Along those same lines, when we attend church regularly, we allow the the preacher or the Sunday school teacher, to speak God's Word to us and help us apply it to our lives. So in doing these things regularly, we are guarding our hearts and consciously working to expose sin in our lives. Perhaps sin we didn't even know was there. But as we we study the Scriptures, as we're taught, God reveals it to us, and we're able to repent of it. Yet, that is really not enough, though, due to the fact That as we said last week, we are so prone to sin, so prone to leave the God we love, so prone to justify our sin and make excuses for ourselves. Like David, we can be blinded by our own sin, or we can have such a need or desire in our life for something that we are prone to embrace ungodly means to fulfill that need or desire. We just want it so bad, it is, it is just almost impossible to resist for us. And so we will give in to, to ungodly means to, to have that which we want. And so God has given us each other to speak truth like Nathan does here for David. We don't say, of course, thus says the Lord, but we do say, this is what the Bible says. We ask loving but sometimes uncomfortable questions. And when we get an answer that goes against Scripture, we point our brothers and sisters to those Scriptures. That is what believers do for each other if if we love, if we truly love one another. And let me just say that fortunately I've had the experience of going to some of you in the past to ask about something in your life. And I've been blessed by the fact that you responded in a humble and God-glorifying manner, and even corrected some things in your life. That is such a huge blessing for a pastor to see that in the life of the congregation, that they were st- that, that, that the humility, the faith in God is there to, to, to accept correction. Unfortunately, I should also add, I would say that the greatest reason, I think, over the last 15 years for folks leaving our church has been an unwillingness to repent of sin and error in their lives. And that is always so heartbreaking to see. But if God truly loves us, He will pursue us and convict us of our sin. We can often think that if God loves us, maybe He will just allow certain indiscretions to slide. But it's the exact opposite, folks. If he truly loves us, he's going to give us his best. And sin is never God's best for us. It would be unloving for him to allow us to continue in that sin. And so he will never settle for that in our lives. And thank God for that. And he will use his word and his people and his his loving pursuit of us as he did here with David. That then brings us to our next lesson. Grace convicts. Now, what Nathan Now, what does Nathan actually say here to David? Well, he begins with a perfectly prepared message. 
a, a message truly designed to draw out David's sin. He tells a story that could have easily been true, a story of an offense by one neighbor against another. And of course, the king was supposed to be the judge of those most difficult cases. So all this seemed very realistic to David, which helped lead to his response. So, so Nathan tells a story of two men, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, and the poor man only had this one ewe lamb that he treated like a member, like a member of the family. Clearly, the, the comparison is uh, Bathsheba to the ewe lamb, which I think, again, leans towards her being more of a victim than anything in this affair. But the rich man had a guest come to visit him. But instead of being willing to use one of the many sheep that he possessed, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and killed it and cooked it and served it to his guest. Well, <clears throat> this flew all over David. He was incensed. It says in verse 5 that this news greatly kindled his anger against the man. And he declares that this man deserves to die, and he will at least restore the lamb fourfold because of his act and the lack of pity he showed the poor man. Now, we might be thinking at this point, oh, good, David's, David's coming along here. He's coming around. He's going to get it and see the parallel with himself here. But here's a lesson for us, folks. Unfortunately, when a person is deep in sin, they are often too blind to see it on their own without, without more help. In fact, most likely, if Nathan had left it there and walked off you know, thinking, well, David's going to pick it up as he thinks more about it. No, this might have done nothing but further solidified David's sin. Because you see, some of the most self-righteous people you run across are actually some of the most sinful. And that's why they're so self-righteous. In order to justify themselves, they unload on others for their sin. And by doing so, it proves to themselves that they are righteous despite those nagging doubts about their own sin. You know, it's like, just look at how much I hate that sin and that person. That, 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 shows, that, that shows how, much, how righteous I am and how much I, I hate sin. Sin can be so deceitful. Even though David had committed a very similar sin on a far worse scale, instead of seeing it, he gets up on his high horse. Wow. That's why the most kind and patient and merciful people are those who have experienced God's grace for themselves. They have dealt with their own sin and, 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 and experience the forgiveness that God gives in Jesus Christ. But for those who are the most full of sin, they are oftentimes the most judgmental. So Nathan has to bring it home for David now. That, this is why we can, we can say grace convicts. David is trapped in his sin. And he needs to deliver. And Nathan confronts him in order to convict him. And so Nathan says to David in response to his self-righteous anger, You are the man. And Nathan doesn't wait on a response after that. At this point, Nathan then gives to thus says the Lord. The first one is in verses 7 through 10, where he declares that in response to David killing Uriah, that the sword will not depart from his house ever. In fact, some commentators point to David's own declaration, if you go back to verse 6, that the rich man must pay back fourfold, uh, fourfold for, for his crime, that this is actually what happens to David. He, David had four sons who all died. He will lose this, this son that uh, he had with Bathsheba, and then his oldest son Amnon, for the rape of Tamar coming in the next chapter, Absalom after that for his insurrection against David, and finally Adonijah for his efforts to dethrone his brother Solomon later on. Much of the rest of the book of 2 Samuel is about the Lord carrying, or carrying out the consequences for David's sin. 
Then the other, thus says the Lord, promises that just as David took Uriah's wife in secret, so will a neighbor take David's wives, plural, but not, but, but, but not in secret, but out in the open instead. And we'll see that fulfilled in verse, or chapter 16. Yeah, what I think is most crucial in the Lord confronting David are two other things. First, the Lord points out how good he has been to David in verses 7 and 8. He gave David the kingdom of Saul, and he says he would have given him even more. And so he's seeking to convict David here. As he's confronting him on his sin, he is seeking to convict David in light of his goodness to David. He's saying, how could you do this after how good I've been to you and would have continued to be good to you? And the other thing is that he defined David's sin twice as despising. He despised the word of the Lord in verse 9. And he despised the Lord in verse 10. So what the Lord appealed to in order to lead David to be convicted of his sin was not the consequences was really not the consequences. There have been many people, folks, who have falsely repented because they were just upset at the consequences their sin had brought upon them. They were so sorry because they wanted the consequences to go away. They were so humble and sad, but when the consequences didn't go away, then they became angry as if they they were being done wrong. Or if the consequences did go away, then they went right back to their sin. Consequences are only helpful if they, if, they're, if they back up, if they're backed up with an appeal to the conscience. The conscience must be affected. And so God appeals to the conscience of David that he has sinned against God after God had been so good to him. And in that sin, he was actually despising God. He despised God for his goodness to him. It wasn't just a mistake. A loss of forethought at what, what could happen if he, if, he, if he went down that road. No, he despised the Lord and his goodness to him. So if you are to be convicted, if we are to be convicted of sin, this is how. This is how. We see, we are to see how good God has been to us and how awful We have been to him. That's what sin ultimately is. Not just a mistake. Not a lack of forethought. No, God calls it despising him. Despising his goodness to us. True conviction of of sin will break our hearts. Not for the consequences, but for what what it means to God. What we do to God. And so for David, by God's grace, he is convicted and confesses, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, I know it's short, but folks, it's honest and to the point. In light of what the Lord has just said to David, David is taking ownership. He's not giving one of those half apologies that you hear sometimes I know we've all heard them, we've we've also given them. Uh, You know, if I did anything to hurt you, I am sorry. If, that means you're not sure you did anything, right? But, you know, if if the offended is going to make a big deal about it, then I'm going to apologize so I can just get you off my back. All right? That's what that apology means. It's not a good thing to put if on the front of your apologies. So no, David doesn't do that. God exposes the sin. God defines the sin. And David owns it. I have sinned against the Lord. And here's the wonderful thing, folks. If God gives the grace to convict us of sin, and he must so certainly must be the one who gives the grace. If he, conv- if he gives the grace to convict us of sin, bringing us to confess... He also promises to forgive. And Nathan immediately assures David of the Lord's forgiveness. As 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Folks, 
let us learn from David. We would consider David a believer. His sin was ultimately covered about a thousand years later on the cross. But he was, under, he was certainly under a covenant of grace with God, looking towards those, those promises in Christ. Yet, he, yet still, as a believer, he did these horrible things. But let this be a lesson for us, folks, that there is nothing we've done that God can't handle, that he can't forgive, and that his church, as the people of God, can't be merciful There's nothing that we can't be merciful and understanding towards as well. But folks, you can't hold on to it. You can't hold on to it. If you are His, He will eventually wear you down until you confess it. Did you know one of the the causes of anxiety is unconfessed sin? Not in all cases. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying if you're struggling with anxiety, it's because you've got some unconfessed sin. I'm just saying that is one of the causes that perhaps we need to to ask ourselves about. The fear of being discovered or exposed. People knowing the real you creates anxiety. Folks, there's nothing you've done that God can't forgive. And, And that's what we should truly be after. Too too often we don't confess things because we're more worried about what each other thinks instead of God. Okay? We're we're, we're, we're more concerned about how this is going to make us look. Well, folks, let me break some news to you, okay? You're all corrupt. (laughs) You're all sinners. You got sin you don't even know about yet that God's going to reveal to you later as he continues to work his grace in you. You are all horrible people, me included, okay? All right? If if we knew what each other thought in our minds, we, we we would be under the pews right now. So ashamed if people knew everything about us, Okay? Folks, folks the, 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 the path to peace is not in, in, what, in what everybody thinks about us. It's about what God thinks about us. Okay? It, is, it is knowing that he forgives. And, he, and see, here's the thing. He does know all those thoughts. He knows everything about us. Yet he still chooses to, to, to love us and to forgive us of all of our sin. He chose to go to the cross in his son and suffer for all those horrible things we do, we've done and and continue to do. So folks, we need to come clean and embrace his promise of forgiveness in Christ. Well that well that should that should do it then, don't you think? He confessed, the Lord forgave It's time to move on, right? Well, not exactly. David is absolutely forgiven by God. There's no question about that. The sin has been put away. Nathan has said that. That means the guilt of David's sin has been removed and the punishment that should go with it, which is death. And Nathan says David won't die. Not only that, he is absolutely loved by God. The whole event is framed in God's love and compassion for David. That's why God pursued David and wouldn't accept or allow David to live in his sin. He wanted more for David. He had purposes for David that were far greater. And because of that, because of that love for David, even though his sins are forgiven, there are consequences to David's sin that God requires. And the Lord has already mentioned some of those consequences, but he mentions one other in verse 14. Upon telling David that his sins are forgiven, Nathan then says, Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. So in verse 15 it says that the Lord afflicted the child. But notice how David responds. You would think that he might go off and mourn, but he doesn't do just that. He, he goes and, and intercedes for the child before God. He fasted and laid on the ground all night. He did this for seven days, but the child still dies. 
David's servants witnessed all this and were afraid to tell him after how upset he had been. They were afraid that he might hurt himself further. But David picks up on the whispering and asks about the child, and they give him the news. At that point, he gets up, he washes, puts on some cologne, changes his clothes, and goes to the house of the Lord and worships. He then comes back and eats, and the servants are amazed at this. They can't figure out why he's not as upset now that the child is dead. And David answers in in verse 22, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows whether the child will be gracious? I'm sorry, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Now, there's a few things to unpack there. First, we have some evidence here, I think, about the afterlife of a child. Uh, According according to to Peter, in Acts chapter 2, verses 30 and 31, David believed he would be with the Lord. When this life was over, he believed he would be with the Lord as he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ in Psalm 16. Okay, David believed in the afterlife. He believed in, in the coming Savior through his own offspring and that that Savior would bring uh, salvation, eternal life. And David believed that was for him. Okay, That when this life was over, David would be with the Lord in heaven. Okay, And so I would argue here that David is affirming, by what he says here, he, he is affirming that he will see his child again. And, and this child uh, was a baby unable to consciously believe in God, to believe in a Savior for the forgiveness of his sins. Yet David affirms that he will see his child again. So I believe all this is to say David's words here about his child points to some kind of age of accountability where God shows mercy and grace to children who die before they reach an age where they can, they can with, by the grace of God, understand their need for Christ and believe. Okay, He believed in afterlife. He believed he was going to see his child again. His child was an infant, unable to be able to put their faith in Christ, consciously understanding these things. So David, speaking of seeing his child again, speaks of, I think, of an age of accountability. We, don't really, we can't really have a clear idea about what that age is, but, um, but there is some age of accountability there. Uh, so I say this for several reasons, not only because it's there, but, but first, obviously it gives us hope in the death of a child. If I had to do a funeral of a, of a child, I've not had to do one. Uh, hope, I hope I never have to do uh, a funeral for a child but we can, have, we can have a hope and assurance, I believe, that that child is, is with the Lord. Secondly, practically speaking, it means that we don't have to fret as parents. We don't have to fret and try to rush our child to understand the gospel and believe before something happens to, happens to them. We are to be faithful in, in teaching them, but we can still trust God to bring about saving faith in His timing and within the natural development of a child. okay, We don't want to bring something about prematurely faster than God is bringing it about. We, we teach them the word of God, teach them the gospel, train them the way they should go, and trust God to, to bring them to a saving knowledge of him. Thirdly, I bring this up. Important lesson for us folks, and hear, hear me when I say this. It teaches us not to assume anything. Okay? Just because the idea that all children go to heaven sounds good to us doesn't make it so. Let me say that again. Just because the idea that all children go to heaven sounds good to us doesn't make it so. I believe it's so, but I believe it's so because I can be defended from God's Word. (laughs) You see, God's Word is always our authority. God's word is what we go to to understand what truth is. Okay? But the other thing we see here in David's words to his servants is David's understanding of the grace of God. His sin has certainly blinded him before, but here he seems to be acting like the old David. 
And his faith in God's grace to him is utterly amazing. First, that despite what the Lord had already told him, he felt confident about interceding for this child. The Lord had already said that as a consequence of a sin, his child would die. You would think that that, that that'd be it. You know, God said it, so enough enough there. It's got to move on with life. Yet David cries out to God for his child anyway. And when asked why, he says in verse 22, For I said, who knows whether the child, sorry, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. Then in verse 20, in light of his child just dying and other looming consequences facing David, the sword that will never depart his house, his wives being taken by his neighbor. Folks, he goes to the house of the Lord and worships. Stop and think about that for a second. Think about the consequences that were coming to David. The sword would never leave his house. God has promised that to him. And the consequence for his sin. His wives were going to be taken by someone else. That's what he was looking towards down the road in his life. That was the expectation. Yet in light of that, he's able to go in the house of the Lord and worship. Think about it. How many times have you come into this place? How many times have you come into this place with all kinds of problems in your life and you never could focus on the Lord in your worship because you had all of these other things going on in your mind, laying on your heart. And you just kind of went through the motions and left. And you could really say, you really, you really never worshiped the Lord. You, your heart was never really moved because you, could not, you couldn't focus on him. You were just focused in, 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 the, in what you were dealing with. How could David do that? I don't know if I've, I don't know if I've, um, you know, definitely had hard times in my life, but I don't know if I've been promised by God that the sword was never going to depart from my house the rest of my life. And, 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 and what he promised with his wives, his home, yet, yet he's still able to go to the house of the Lord and worship the God who has just told him these things. Folks, I love what commentator Dale Davis says about this. He says that David had more than a doctrine of grace. He had a sense of grace. He had more than a doctrine of grace. He had a sense of grace. And it led him to be bold before God. It's truly amazing. He didn't just, he didn't have a doctrine of grace centered just, he didn't have just a doctrine of grace centered around God's sovereignty and mercy and transforming power. He certainly certainly believed those things. that, that, That is who God is. So he certainly believed those things. But he also, but it was also a doctrine of deep compassion and love to one who was so undeserving. Folks, David believed God truly loved him. He sensed it. He knew it. Okay? And it's because of that that in light of what he's getting ready to face, he can worship the Lord. See, folks, in that that kind of love, All things are possible. All things are possible. David believed it was possible for God, despite what he had said, to relent and show David's child mercy. And also because of that confidence in God's grace and love, he's able to worship God while knowing the consequences that await him. A man who knows the love of God in this way knows that whatever consequences may come, he can trust God with it. You see, folks, consequences for sin for a believer are not the same as they are for an unbeliever. They can be just as consequential in many ways 
but they are not motivated the same way. For the unbeliever, it is judgment. God responds to the sin of an unbeliever with judgment. Okay, But for the believer, it is done out of grace. If God brings consequences for our sin, it is ultimately for our good. It is for, it is for, it is for good. And we can always trust Him with it. And I want to mention three particular reasons for consequences. Again, not for judgment, but for our good. Number one is to correct. As we read earlier in Hebrews 12, David needed to feel, David needed to feel the pain of his sin. David needed to feel the pain of his sin to train him to hate his sin like God hates it. To see the danger in it. Can you imagine if, if, if God would have just said, okay, I forgive you. Let's just start over. Let's not, let's not worry about anything. This is in the past. No, no problem. Okay? Just, just like never happened. Okay? Now, again, God's forgiveness is like that. <laughs> it, is, it is removed. Okay? And he loves us. He holds nothing against us in that, in that respect. But if he had, if he had just, just let David do that to Bathsheba, do that to Uriah, and all the other people it affected in watching that, you know, what, would, what would that have been? What would, what would David's attitude towards sin truly be? But over these next chapters we're going to go through, we're going to see a man in, in, who's going to experience a lot of pain as he watches the consequence of his sin. And don't you know he is being trained throughout that to hate sin, to fear sin, to see it as the danger, to want to flee from it and stay from it, away from it at all costs, okay? So God does that for us as well. He'll allow us to, he'll, he'll allow us to, to face the consequences of, of the sin in our life, bad decisions we've made because he's training us. It's not because he doesn't love us. He loves us absolutely, completely. He, he covered your sin. He suffered for your sin. But he, he has us to go through it to train us, to hate sin. Secondly, it is to show the world that God doesn't have one set of rules for his people and another for everyone else. He is righteous, and therefore he holds people accountable. And the evidence that we truly belong to God, that we are truly in Christ is that we are willing to submit to God's correction and face the consequences of our sin. And so through this, you see the witness that we can become? What a powerful witness we can become when, when we face these consequences of our sin and, and, we, can, and we can ultimately look, look to God and say, this, this is ultimately the hand of God. God is using this in my life. And I trust Him. I worship Him. Because I know through Christ I am forgiven. So whatever consequences I'm facing, I can still praise Him and rejoice in Him. And I can tell you why I'm having to go through these things. Why I'm having to deal with these consequences. Because of these bad decisions in my life. Because I, I went against God. I, didn't, I, I, re, I rejected His goodness to me. I despised His Word instead of trusting it. Now I see that. And these ongoing consequences are a reminder to me to never walk down that path again. It's training us and it's allowing us to be a witness for everyone else. Too often we're just like, oh, I just want it to go away. Please go away. Why is my life so miserable? Because God's doing good things in your life even through the consequences of your sin. And thirdly, is to show that forgiveness is not easy. It's to show forgiveness is not easy. It's free, but it is not easy. David was, now, now, now hear me folks, David was forgiven up front. So I'm not saying David had to go through this like penance or something. I'm not, he had to go through or do, through anything like that. I'm not saying that. No, David was forgiven up front. Okay? But there was a cost. And that, and, and, that ultimately, and that ultimately points, that ultimately points 
to the source of that forgiveness, David's son, Jesus Christ. He would come into the world a thousand years later and give his life as a ransom for many. Through him, we have forgiveness because he died in our place. He did suffer. He did die so that we, like David, wouldn't have to die. And so as we go through those ongoing consequences of sin, it's a reminder. It points to how far more our Savior went through to provide us forgiveness. Finally, our last point. Our last section, verses 24 through 31. Two accounts that don't seem to be related, but I believe they are. The first one in verses 24 and 25 tells of David going to Bathsheba to comfort her. And we see here that this is the first time that Bathsheba is referred to as David's wife and not Uriah's wife. And he lays with her and she conceives again. And David names the child Solomon, which is derived from the Hebrew word shalom, meaning peace. In faith, David believes that this child is a sign of peace with God. Yet then the Lord confirms it by sending Nathan again with a message. But this time it is the Lord, it is that the Lord loved Solomon and therefore gave him the name Jedidiah, which means loved by the Lord. So let me just add here to what I believe, that I believe this is an affirmation to anyone who might have entered a relationship and married under not the best of circumstances, okay? Perhaps two people had an affair, who knows, left their current spouse, got married, very ungodly circumstances. I don't know if that circumstance is in here, but I'm just saying it could be something like that. Yet if, there, if there's an example, yet, yet, yet there's an example of how God can forgive here and take what we intended for evil and make something good out of it. It is this situation with David and Bathsheba. God is clearly now showing his approval. A couple would certainly need to acknowledge and confess to God their sin in the relationship as we see David do. Perhaps even confess to the ex-husband or, or ex-wife their sin. But then, I think the scripture is showing us that they could move forward in confidence that God forgives and blesses their union. No one has to live in this fear that because their relationship started the wrong way, that it's always going to be uh, looked at by God and, with a frown. No, there is grace for those who turn to Christ and repent. There is grace, and he can bless that kind of relationship. But then finally, we have the battle with the Ammonites concluded in verses 26 through 31. Joab calls David to come and finish the Ammonites off and claim the victory, which he does. And so in spite of all that has happened in these, in these last two chapters, it ends with peace and reconciliation. Peace in David's relationship with Bathsheba and now with the Ammonites. And I believe these two situations are put here together to show us a picture of the peace and reconciliation God brings to his people in pursuing and convicting and correcting them. We, we never have to worry of God's ongoing displeasure of us for past sins. If we've confessed those sins and repented of those sins, Ongoing consequences are to train us and be a witness to the world of his justice, that he doesn't show favoritism to his people's sin. And ultimately, to show that forgiveness is costly. It costs our Savior everything to provide it for us. But you can rest assured, believer, that if you are in Christ, you have peace with God, despite what ongoing struggles you may face. All of his anger is removed and replaced with his absolute love. So hate your sin, confess it, and trust in the love of your Savior. And let me just close by inviting anyone who is not in Christ, who has not put their faith in Christ at his cross for the forgiveness of your sin and the gift of eternal life, 
to do so this day. I'll be around afterward to to speak with you further about, about that. But understand, without Christ, there is no peace. There is no reconciliation. As serious as God took David's sin, he must certainly, he most certainly takes that serious our sin. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace upon David. And in many ways, Father, we, well, we, we thank you for how you providentially worked in his life. We, we, are, we are thankful for his failures and what it teaches us. And we thank you for your grace on him. And, and, and what it teaches us and what we have in you in Christ. So, Father, give us grace to, to fight our sin, to hate sin, to, that, that uh, our sin would, the, the guilt of it would truly pierce our conscience, that we would not just be concerned about the consequences and what other people might think, but we would ultimately be concerned about what you think and, and what this says about our, our feelings about you. And so, Father, help us to see your goodness and how our sin is a, is a despising of, of you and your goodness, your word and your goodness. And it would truly penetrate us and convict us and that we would own our sin and turn from it. And so, Father, uh, that we would be able to worship you in the midst of consequences of sin. So, Father, bless us in these things. And, and if you, again, if anyone is here, here does not know you as Savior, that Today they would believe in you. So Father, we love you, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.